What is going on, everybody? Bobby Thigh here with my guys, Kenny Hyder and Jordan from Sabersim, joining us to talk about the PGA Championship and uh, really looking forward to this week and really happy to have you back here, Jordan. I thought it was really, really helpful last time. And, you know, in addition to just watching this video, even if some of you guys aren't playing golf, it does give you, a, you know, more ideas. Jordan obviously understands how to use Sabersim better than any of us does. And uh, it's, you know, always really helpful for me when we do these. And hopefully you're, at, you're finding the same. And uh, I would encourage you guys to check out this video, whether or not Jordan is, uh, I'm sorry, whether or not uh, you're a golf player or not, because it, it does help us with some, some of the Saber Sim stuff. I do think that we've answered most of your guys' questions about a lot of the things, but we want to teach you, you know, talk about some different tools and tricks and ways to best utilize Saber Sim. So Jordan, great to have you here. And uh, how's everything going? What are, your, what, are your, what are your thoughts on this week? It's a big week for us, I know, uh, out here in the industry. It is. Yeah. A major week's always fun. Uh, always pretty, pretty chaotic. I think, um, especially, uh, this week we've got, uh, some, some weather chaos maybe going on here as well, but, uh, excited to be back talking a little bit of, uh, Saber Sim, uh, golf strategy here. So, um, I can go ahead and, and just, uh, dive right in here. Let's do um, it. yeah, cool. So we've got, uh, Saber Sim pulled up, uh, on the, the true DFS site. One thing that's really cool here, right off the bat, uh, the true DFS projections here loaded right in. Um, you can also switch back and forth between the, the Saber Sim and the true DFS projections. You can use an average of a two. Uh, so really cool to have that loaded right in the app. But um, right off the bat, something that I think is is kind of unique about Saber Sim or is actually the, the defining feature of Saber Sim. Uh, this, this page will look pretty similar if you've used a traditional optimizer before projections, uh, players, ownership, et cetera. But we actually, we the way we come up with our projections and uh, what powers Sabres in behind the scenes is our simulations. So if we click on a guy like Scotty Scheffler, right? Uh, projection will, will pull up 74.24. Um, but we actually have simulated this tournament out thousands of times, the whole by whole round by round simulation. Uh, and we've actually got the full distribution for these different golfers here. Obviously, you know, we see a 74, 24 projection doesn't actually really mean that much average projections. I think in golf aren't as useful and we can see here, you know, really the story is, uh, for a guy like Scheffler, highest salary golfer in the in the field, got a rare rare sims where misses the cut happens. You know, maybe twenty percent of the time ish, twenty five actually it looks like. And then uh, this big distribution of every time he makes the cut, uh, the most likely outcomes when that happens. And then this big upside tail here, uh, and that's what we're shooting for when we're trying to take down GBPs is these big upside outcomes for these guys. Right. Um, so. I'll do kind of a quick demo of how this all comes into play here real quick, and then we can uh, dive in a little bit deeper at, at any step of the process. But I think the easiest way to kind of visualize how cool this is, is to just build some lineups. So what I'm going to do, I'm just going to build 150 lineups here uh, for traditional 150 max kind of build here. We'll see what this looks like. And I think, um, you know, one thing that's really difficult about traditional optimizers working with golf and i um, curious to hear your guys' thoughts on this as well. But one thing that I've always found difficult is when you come out on the other side, it's very hard to get away from just like really cashy looking lineups. You get like a ton of exposure to guys that are just projected pretty well point per dollar. You get a lot of chalky builds. Um, we don't really get that here, right? We're, we're pulling directly from those simulations, building lineups that are kind of well leveraged against the field right out of the gate. And we can see 150 lineups, you know, 20% exposure to our highest owned golfer. We're not just blindly eating a bunch of chalk. We got a little bit of a fade on a guy like Rom or Berger on some of these guys right here, right off the bat. Uh, the lineups that you're getting right out of the gate with Sabersim when you're building your golf pool uh, are viable. They're, they're GPP ready lineups where you can, of course, add a ton of value. Um, but because we're pulling from those simulations directly when we build these lineups, the, the lineups are already pretty well op optimized for upside. So um any thoughts on that from you guys? Any questions you have for me right off the bat? I always feel like that's just a good opportunity to introduce things that make us a little bit different and, and show a build because it really is. It's I think once you see that first build, uh, you can kind of see how different Sabersim is than, than what else is out there. Yeah. yeah. So go ahead. Go ahead, Kenny. So I, I, uh, I've been using Sabersim now for a couple months and I, I only, uh, play golf. So it's kind of my only exposure. Yeah. And the thing about golf is that it's such a high variance game that, you know, what Sabersim does is actually really fantastic because, um, you know, how I like to use it is I'll do my research and kind of figure out what the core guys I'm targeting are going to be. And that because of Sabersim allows me to target things like in a weird way. So for example, this week, you know, it's such a packed field mm -hmm. and, you know, there's guys that are, you know, 
studs that are, you know, DJ is $9,500 this week. You know what I mean? Right. And so, so like this week, my, my focus is really like in the, you know, low seven K six K range, because that's really where I think you're going to need a couple of home runs to get, you know, you get a couple of really cheap guys that are, you know, minimum ownership that end up, you know, top 15 or something like that. Saberson will take care of the rest. So I don't have to worry about DJ or, or Jordan Spieth or Xander. I can just worry about, Oh, I like, you know, this guy who's 6,500 and I want, you know, 15% ownership exposure to him. And then it kind of puts things together. And I also really like how it, you know, the, the kind of out the door is, you know, ownership is usually like sub 50%. Like I see, we have one here in, at 66, but usually my builds end up being like, you know, 30, 40% ownership, which is fantastic. I mean, back in the day using other optimizers, I would always set like the maximum to a hundred, but a hundred is even way too much. You know what I mean? Total ownership. Yeah. So I really like that, but I do have one question for you. So um, a couple weeks ago, I can't remember what, I, maybe it's three weeks ago or something. I can't remember what tournament was. And I was, you know, doing some Saberson builds. And I, I also like it because what I'll typically do, you know, I'll like, if I'm going to play a GPP, I'll do that, you know, 150 entries or whatever. Yeah. A couple 20 maxes. But then what I also kind of do is, so I'll, I'll bundle up like all the single or three max entries and then build like 10 lineups in the constraints of the size of field. Like if I'm going to play five single entries that are all, 5,000 to 10,000 players, I'll just put those and build, you know, five lineups in SaberSim and then kind of optimize one by one instead of just putting in, oh, one lineup for this and then one, you know, and kind of can pick and choose. That way I get like exposure in groupings too. So if I want to go heavy on DJ, but I also want to hedge against him, it's like maybe I'll play him in my single entries, but not in the GPPs, you know, or something like that. Mm -hmm. But the one question I did have, so a few weeks back, and I can't remember the player. It's, I should have taken a note or something, but I had kind of gone through the build and I hadn't really, I had made like two adjustments. Like I had like 60% ownership as my max, uh, you know, to my biggest guy, which I thought mm -hmm. was a little too much. So I like toned that down to like 40 or something. And I made like one other adjustment. And then there was a guy who was like 6,200 or something that I wanted to play. And I put just like 5% min exposure to him. And it automatically went to, you know, do you want to build more lineups? Yeah. Now I had a, a conversation with Sheets uh, a while back and he was saying like, whenever he gets to that, do you want to build more lineups? He knows he's done too much. And it's just kind of like, oh, I need to back off and, and, and let SaberSim do its thing. But in that scenario, I think what was just happening is that in the projections, because he was a golfer that didn't have a lot of data behind him, I think he was like a European tour player or something like that. Yeah. He just, he didn't fit into the model. So in that sort of scenario, would you recommend maybe setting the minimum exposure before you start the build? Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, I mean, anytime you get that message, right? And if, if we were to get that message to show up right now, it's saying there's not 150 lineups in this pool of 500 that match everything we were trying to do with the exposures. Um, that can come up, I think, primarily that comes up in two situations. One, if you've got a player that you are taking like a really significant stand on, like if you've got some guy, you're not getting any exposure and then you try to just like lock him in, right? Right away, we're right. going to get that message. Right. Uh, or another way, if you've made a ton of changes, uh, a ton of very small changes, at some point you just run out of lineups to, to right. sort through here. So um, I think, yeah, the best thing to do in that kind of situation is to come back to the home screen and make an adjustment here. I think you can do that in the form of setting a min exposure. That's perfectly fine here. Um, I think you can also do that in the form of adjusting the projection, right? Um, and it, it kind of, it's up to uh, you. I think I lean a little bit more to the side of adjusting a projection because like, for example, let's say, you know, let's say we got some guy down here. I don't know. For some reason, I haven't done a ton of research for this particular event yet. Uh, uh, looking forward to doing that here later this afternoon. But let's say I'm like really in on, on Lanto Griffin or something like that. Well, instead of setting that min exposure here and just forcing him into my lineups, I might instead maybe bump his projection to, I don't know, uh, 52 or something like that. Give him like a 5% something bump. Mm -hmm. And the reason I like to do that with projections is because now I can... Now I can build the lineup and kind of use Saversim as an advisor and say, okay, if Lanto's projection was 52 points, how much would you get, right? How much, how much would I get there? And if you're still not getting a lot of him, then that's maybe an opportunity to kind of do what Sheet said and say, like, I'm going to, 
pause. Maybe I'm missing something about this particular player. Um, mm-hmm. Short answer, there's no wrong way to do it. You can bump the projection. You can set a min exposure, whatever you want to do. Whenever you get that message on the build screen, um, good sign to go back and make some adjustments on the home tab. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That, that makes a lot of sense. And, and, and curious, Jordan, talk about a little bit about your, you know, your process in general for you know, I, 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 do you ever do any hand building? Or are you just, are you going strictly in, in building through here? I'm, I'm just curious in, in general uh, for golf. Yeah. So I, I, a lot of times for, for golf in particular, I like to build 150. Um, mm-hmm. I like to just have a big kind of pool, a uh, big portfolio of players, a lot to work with. So I'm not doing too much hand building. I do pretty much everything that I'm going to end up building uh, through Saber Sim. So, right. um, and especially with those big kind of, wide wider builds right typically 150 max 10 to 50k that sim variance is going to be really high um Mm -hmm. i really do like what uh kenny said here um if you're playing some of the smaller field stuff kind of grouping your contest together right we can see these sliders here the ownership fade slider and the sim variance slider and i'll explain what these are in here in a minute but uh they change based on the contest right so if we're playing a 150 max maybe we're playing the milli right uh, going to be a different strategic approach to how these lineups are going to be built compared to if we're playing like the, I don't know, the, the $200 single entry, probably something a little bit closer to this, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I love the idea of grouping your builds together and saying, I'm going to build my single entries, my three maxes in this build. I'm going to figure out my strategy for that. Then I'm going to jump over my 150 and I'm going to figure out my strategy for that. Um, real quickly, I guess I should say for, for people that aren't as familiar uh, what, what these sliders actually do. So I'm going to start with sim variance. That's the more important one. Uh, this is controlling how many sims are we looking at as we build each individual lineup. So I mentioned we've simulated out this tournament thousands of times. Every lineup is going to be built based on a subset of those simulations. As sim variance gets higher, all the way up to 10, uh, we're using fewer and fewer simulations with one single tournament simulation at 10 here. Right. So as this slider comes down, we end up using something closer to the average projections to build the lineups. As this slider goes up, we use closer to single simulation performances to build lineups. Um, And the ownership fade slider is basically how much do you want to take into account ownership? We're going to fade the chalk more aggressively as the slider gets higher. We're going to be a little less concerned about ownership as the slider gets lower. So um, if you're building for those smaller fields, single entries kind of things that where I, I would typically be doing a little bit more of like a, a hand building approach, I would stick down here in this range. Mm-hmm. No, it makes, it makes a lot of sense. And I, and I do want to point out a couple of things that I noticed right off the bat that I looked at, this, you know, some other projection systems just sort of to get an idea what was out there. Mm-hmm. And there's a pretty strong stance that SaberSim is taking on an ownership uh, that, you know, the, the, you take this top tier and you got, you know, the Scheffler, Rom, just JT tier, where I, I'm looking else other places that, that basically have all these guys as the same ownership. And they do that a lot on, on some of these sites. Um, and I, I, I wasn't necessarily buying it either, but it, it, does, it does stand out to me. There's just kind of like, you know, to see Scheffler is, you know, projected to be under 10% owned. It just, it just kind of like, it kind of blew my mind. And I also think that other sites though, they, they when there's guys who are all sort of great in golf, they tend to sort of just bunch them together. I yeah. just wanted to, to ask you a little bit about, you know, if, if there's anything you wanted to elaborate on about, you know, how we do, how you do the ownership projections, you know, stuff like that, because I, I do find it's very different. And I find that it's more accurate than most other sites that I use. And in, in almost all cases, and sometimes there's one that's different or whatever, but the ownership projection is a really big deal, obviously, especially as it relates to golf. Yeah. And um, that's, that's a really, really strong stance that's, that's different than what other sites are doing. Uh, the Rom Scheffler, Thomas tier, especially. Yeah, absolutely. And and to be completely honest, I don't know if I'm totally uh, 100% uh-huh. bought in on 32% uh, yeah. ROM ownership this week. I think that probably is going to come in a little bit lower here. Yeah. Um, but I will explain a little bit of what we do. So we we basically take our projections. Um, the, our own projections are our kind of primary input into our own uh, ownership projections. And then we build a ton of lineups at a really high variance setting. Uh, and then what those players exposure is in that lineup pool ultimately becomes their ownership projections. Mm -hmm. Um, So I think there's a few things that that are are very useful about that, primarily because we're building real lineups with uh, to to generate the ownership projections, we'll pick up on uh, salary requirements and and, uh, salary scarcity, I guess, at different bands of where where the value is on that particular week in a way that I think uh, some other ownership projections don't always necessarily pick up on. So, you know, if it's a week with, um, 
I don't know, a really nice 7K range or something like that. Well, maybe that opens up more opportunities to to play a little bit more expensive guys on the other side, even if they're not that much higher projected than the, the 9K range or something like that. Uh, because we're building lineups to generate ownership projections, we will pick up on, on things like that. Um, what we will not pick up on it because we're using a really kind of uh, computer-based approach for ownership is, is narratives. Um, if there's a particular narrative that's pumping up or bringing down ownership on a per certain guy, that can be stuff like, you know, really elite recent form or like a uh, particularly good or bad course fit or history or anything that people are kind of talking about that isn't something that's just going to show through right away in the projections. It's also not going to show up in the ownership projections. Mm -hmm. uh, so I do think uh, you know, I, I, I like the Saberson ownership projections. I think it's, it's a part of my process of seeing, you know, where does our model think things are going to lie, but because golf ownership in particular can just get really narrative driven compared to something like, I think in NBA, for example, just to compare, I think ownership often really does follow the value. It follows the, the projections. I think in golf, people do trust their guts a little bit more. Those narratives can pick up some steam. I would make, I would feel comfortable making some some light adjustments to the ownership projections if something looks off to you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I think that I think that's fair. That makes sense, and I appreciate you, you know, giving a, giving the deluxe answer there. I I, I think that's that's really helpful. Yeah. I do a lot of building by hand, but I I absolutely love you know referring to all this stuff. And I I will when I when I do my one fifty again. It was this was a week I was planning on for sure doing the one fifty. Yeah, I just I just I haven't I've got so much stuff to catch up on that it's uh it's a little overwhelming. So I'm probably am I probably am going to be doing hand building, but I do. You know, like you said, you know, I will all adjust some of the ownerships in my head and I'll and I'll take a sort of a, a look at every what everybody else is saying as well. But I, I do I do think it's interesting where I think a lot of other sites tend to you when you have, you know, similarly similar plays and similar tiers, regardless of sport, they do tend to put them in a similar ownership range. And then you the slate comes out and one guy's five times as much yeah. as the other guy is. And it happens all the time. And they're sort of covering themselves and just sort of doing it in a safe way. And I and I and I that's why I'm always interested to hear, you know, the way that that's done. And I was sure. you if maybe if maybe you wanted to, you know, look, we're we're going to go through some of this stuff, but talk about, you know, if, if for those of us who do hand build, one thing we like to, you know, we, me and Sheets and Kenny do this when we do our, our videos, we sort of go through each tier and talk about our favorite plays and, uh, you know, which guys are going to top five, top ten, and things like that. Wondering if you're if you're up for that this morning to go through it real quick, uh, just in, in each tier. Sure. Yeah, I'd be happy to. Um, so, I mean, I think one thing that, that can be kind of cool uh, or, or one way that I, I have mm -hmm. a couple different strategies of how I like to, to start doing some research and breaking down the slate. But I think one thing that can be pretty useful for that uh, is looking at these, this information over here on the right, the make cut top 20, top 10, et cetera. This information comes directly from our sims. Um, so this is the percentage of game simulations where these or of tournament simulations where these particular outcomes actually take place. Uh, and I think it can be a pretty good approach combined with, you know, the ownership to start figuring out, you know, how, how does the tier break out? And for example, right, let's talk about the, the 10K tier, right? So Rory and up. Um, and we see if we're just looking at like the top five and win equity, basically what we need these guys to do to pay off their salary to be successful in a lineup. Mm -hmm. um, I, there's, there's a kind of a couple patterns I noticed. One, I mean, it looks like Sabersim loves John Rom this week. So yep. would be a clear opportunity to kind of take a stand at this tier. But above and beyond that, we're seeing four other names that are pretty similar in their, their probabilities of these certain outcomes, but we're going to get this big ownership discrepancy here. Right. Um, and to me, the two odd men out, at least looking at where things are right now, are JT and Rory, right? Where we've got John Rom stands kind of up, like ahead above everybody else, at least in terms of his, his win equity over here. Everybody else is pretty close together. So the two guys that it looks like we think are going to be lower owned are Scotty and Morikawa. Um, that's kind of how I think about starting to break out some of these tiers using some of the, the SIM data. I'm looking for basically guys that, that stand out on a projection basis or on an ownership basis. But um, what is, what does that strategy look like for you guys when you're, when you're breaking this down and talking tier by tier? I'm that's, curious what you kind of look at. That's really interesting. I mean, very similar. We're looking for the, you know, the ownership gap. I, I like, and I like what you said about looking at the, 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 the win, you know, and again, I like, I like that it's a simulation, but I, I'm, I'm sort of baffled by the Scheffler not having a higher percentage. 
And is that because I'm just being recency biased because of what he's done this season? Or is it because maybe that maybe the, every simulation is maybe a little bit biased against him because he doesn't have, you know, the history of playing what is, you know, as many majors and, and having incredible results until this season. It does. It did surprise me to see him at half of the uh, projected win equity to, to John Rahm. And, and I would have I would have thought anywhere that that Scheffler would be at, at least on the same level as as Rom uh, just based on what he's accomplished this season and basically just has run away from everybody else in terms of player of the year right now and all that type of thing so that that's just one thing that kind of jumped out at me yeah but if you're going to tell me Scheffler's going to be I mean if, if we're going to believe that he's going to be you know 10 percent owned or sub 10 percent owned I, I definitely want to take you know that shot and believe that what I've been seeing for the last few months is absolutely real and there's nothing that's really led me to go against it even this last tournament last week um you know he still wasn't what didn't win the tournament but uh it certainly didn't give me any reason to feel like he what he isn't the golfer that I think he is right now and uh Kenny I'm curious your thoughts on that as well because that, that sort of stood out to me a little bit the and, and it's not just Saberson that has this like, you can look at any other site and 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 you see the win equity you know the, the win percentage and Scheffler is significantly lower than Rom everywhere else. I, and actually, in some other sites that I looked at, had them at half, had Scheffler as half of the chance to win of, of JT. Um, so I thought that was just kind of interesting that's, because that's Scheffler run away. So yeah, so, 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 say, say your thoughts on that, Kay. So I think that, you know, I, I have no reason to not think that Scheffler has a great shot. Uh, especially just at least for a top five. And that's at least, you know what I mean? And uh, I don't, you know, like you were saying uh, before we started the thing, if I think Scheffler's the favorite until further notice, right? right. So what, 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 what is this about? And the interesting thing to me is how the ownership projections are so wildly different all over the place. Like I, on uh, some other places, I see Rom as the lowest projected ownership mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, JT and Rory and Scheffler are all about the same around 20%, you know what I mean? So it's, mm -hmm. it's really interesting. I think, you know, so the way I kind of think about these builds is tournament to tournament. So this is a major it's studded and, you know, there's tons of talent for cheap. So <clears throat> I'm going to be basically looking for like pairing Rom and Scheffler together and then going in the 6k range for the rest of the build. You know what I mean? Because, uh, there's no reason I, I, I love Rom and I love Scheffler and they're both, you know, they're one and two, what are you going to do? Mm -hmm. So, um, I, 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 it's hard to avoid either of them. Um, you know, the fact that the ownership switches back and forth between Sabersim and our, you know, what we have and whatever, you know, some other places have, um, just means, well, I just have to play them both the rest of the, you know, range there. Okay. I'll just fade that. You know what I mean? I'll just, I'll, I'll stick to the two and the two most expensive, whatever happens, happens. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I I do like. I mean, for what it's worth, in this specific week, I, I like the idea of what Jordan was saying before. Is I, I think I'm gonna be. I mean, I'm gonna trust the numbers as best I can, and I, I'm gonna I'm gonna be overweight on Scheffler. I'm gonna be overweight on JT, and I'm gonna even be overweight on Morikawa, who I feel like yeah. you know things things get sort of like a you know a little bit narrative driven, and we haven't seen the, the absolutely huge performance. Although he hasn't been bad in any of these majors recently, I'm just talking about the recent the recent ones. Um, but I, I I like the idea of being overweight on those guys and. John, Rom is a, you know, Rom was what, what the way that I'm sort of treating Scheffler, you know, he was the best for a while. And, to, and again, until further notice, well, the notice has been served. And now I'm looking at Scheffler that way. And as long as I'm going to get him at lower ownership, I'm always going to be playing him in any of these courses. He also doesn't really have a bad, like, there's no, there's not, there's no course that really doesn't set up well for him. Like he's, he is capable of doing absolutely everything really doesn't have a lot of leaks. Well, yeah, he's, he's first in approach and he's first around the greens. Like what do you want? <laughs> <It's> <laughs> you know? can't be, can't be too bad at anything. So, um, so that's the way I'm treating that. And, and then uh, this week is uh, the guys I'm going to be most heavy on though, will be the lowest owned in this range, which will, which, you know, again, as we talked about, I, 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 I'm still having a hard time getting to Rory, but I am open to, to maybe change my mind on that. As of right now, I have Scheffler, Thomas, and Morikawa as my guys, and it really is ownership-based. And uh, it scares me all the time, because as Kenny knows, I've, I've been overweight on Rom for about two years now. I don't think I've had a tournament yet where I haven't been overweight on Rom, and this might be the one where I'm not overweight on Rom, just because of the ownership. Um, but I do like the way that Kenny was talking about the specific builds. I, I did that, you know, I, I do that pretty commonly. I did it last week with uh, Scheffler and, and JT. I uh, just had them as my as my top spend ups. And then there were so many other guys that we, we thought could be in contention that were cheap. And, and sure enough, there were they were in contention. Um, obviously, didn't end up working out fully to win anything major. But I like the idea of pairing two top guys. And usually people are going to choose between one of these top these yeah. top spend ups. So trying to pair them together, even if they're both popular, if you really like them, I think you're already getting a little bit different just within in your build. Does that make sense? 
absolutely. I think I think it's going to be a pretty uncommon pairing this particular week. Mm-hmm. Um, I think, yeah, the, the combination of those two guys together and, and obviously a ton of upside here with those two guys. It is it is a strange thing just to, to say that, you know, the highest, the most expensive golfer in the field might come in under 10% ownership. That just seems very strange. I think right. that the salaries a lot of times on DK are based off of pretty decent, at least fairly sharp opening opening odds for an event. And it's it just seems wrong to have the high, most expensive golfer in the pool be that low owned. Yep. Yeah. I, I, I totally, uh, I'm totally with you. It's a definitely unusual. Um, let's talk a little bit about the next tier down because yeah. oddly enough, like just, to, I'm just saying myself, me and Kenny haven't talked about any of this stuff for, for before. And I haven't talked with you, Jordan, but my, my instinct is, is actually, I, so I love Cam Smith. Um, I'm going to be very high on Cam Smith this week. I don't care about eating a little bit of chalk in some places. That is probably the guy I'm going to go with. I still keep wanting to wait for the Hovland things. I think it's going to happen one of these days but I think I'm probably going to be more off of it. I think Cam Smith, DJ, and Hideki are my three favorites in this range, but I don't love love this range. Um, and the one guy who really stands out is Brooks. We have Brooks at a major at extremely low ownership, and that's so that, that's something if, if we really believe that that 4% number is, is, is close to accurate, that's the other guy I was thinking about mixing in from this range. But I, I'm not as in love with the 9K range as I usually am, especially for a major. These guys are awesome. Don't get me wrong, but uh, but I sort of like the idea of the two spend ups at the top, or if I do go down to, to this range with my second spend up, uh, maybe playing Cam Smith as that guy uh, with a little bit of cop, a little bit of Brooks, a little bit of Hideki. Uh, those are the three that I that stood out to me. Kay, why don't you say your thoughts, and then Jordan, you could talk a little bit about things that stand out maybe in those, and even if it's some of the same things you already showed us. Because yeah. I, 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 I do, I just want to sorry, one last thing. I do find it incredibly odd to have a less than one percent number on next to Brooks at a major. Just we haven't seen that ever before I would imagine um, in any simulations in the past. So Kenny, who do you like in this range? And then uh, what are your sort of overall thoughts about this? Are, are you going to do the double spend up thing more? So are you staying away from this range or is there anything? Yeah, I I'll be, I'll be staying away from this range more uh, than not. Um, you know, I, like I said, I really like if, uh, you know, if I'm going to do two spend ups, I'm, I'm, I'm going to go for it. I'm going to go for Rahm and Scheffler. So uh, that's going to be hammered. And then that means I can't touch this range ever. You know what I mean? But um, I do like uh, DJ this week just because the ownership is so low mm-hmm. and, uh, you know, he's 9,500. Why is he, he, you know, this guy, DJ, people forget about DJ. He, and, and this is a major, he's a get up guy too. Um, and the fact that he's projected under 10% makes him look great to me. The rest of the range, I, I, I like Cam Smith as well. I don't like that he's super chalky. I don't think that he's going to run away with the tournament. So it's easier for me to get away from him. But because I do think he is such a phenomenal golfer, I will have some exposure to him. Um, and then, yeah, Brooks is interesting. Uh, sounds a little risky to me, especially, you know, in that consideration of, well, he's a spend up guy, you know, like if he was, if he was 8,500, I'd be all over him. You know what I mean? But right. uh, I think, I think in this range, really, I'm just going to be targeting DJ. I like it. Um, what, what are your thoughts, uh, uh, Jordan, on, on this this 9K range? Yeah, so, I mean, a couple thoughts right off the bat. So, with with Brooks, I do think our, our model's definitely a little pessimistic on him. The the Brooks at the major thing, I think, is interesting just because, you know, on the statistical side, you're, you're dealing with still a, a pretty small sample set. Right. Um, and our, our model, I don't think, is really going to buy that there is actually kind of a predictive pattern there. Um I get the argument. And if you're, if you're in on Brooks, I think it's a great opportunity to bump that up because that's something, or even just get him similar to the other guys in this range here. Yep. Cause it's just something that we're just not going to pick up on. And it seems like actually, you know, looking at kind of even the true DFS projections here um, also a little bit like on the lower side here. So I, I will never talk anybody out of giving Brooks a little bit of a bump um, at the major. If you're bought in, I don't know if I'm bought in um, otherwise at the nine K range, I think there's, there's a couple like ownership, kind of landmines here that I think are just going to get a lot of steam. Um, I do think Cantlay is going to be pretty popular down here at this nine, one range. Yeah. Um, I also think Xander with the way he finished out last week is going to be pretty popular. Um, mm-hmm. And I think Spieth is the other guy. I'm basically probably in on anybody else in this range, apart from those three names. So um, those would be the guys that I'd probably be underweight on. I'm, I'm in, I love Hideki this week. I like the DJ play. Um, I'm probably even willing to be a little bit uh, over on, on camp Smith. Cause I think he's going to come in under than compared to, to 
Speed Sander and, and Cantlay. Um, I always find myself playing a lot of Victor Hovland too. I don't know why. I think it's just because <laughs> that ownership always looks a little bit low to me. Um, right. So I would say in this range, I'm I'm in on on any of those other names. Right. I like that. I, I think that's another interesting yeah point. And I, and I I am going to steer your steer clear of the uh, the, the Xander and, and Cantlay chalk probably for the most part. Doesn't mean you won't find a couple of them in some of the lineups for me. Yeah. But, uh, I, it's certainly not something I'm targeting. It is something I am consciously trying to avoid. Although uh, you know Cantlay at 9100, if you just say that out loud, it does sound kind of ridiculous <laughs> based on it does. <laughs> yeah. And, and half, I. But- I think you made a good point there too. And I'm curious your guys' thoughts, just like the way that I go through this. So when I'm, when I'm doing my research, a lot of times I'll leave everybody in the pool. Um, mm-hmm. And when I, like even a guy, if I'm one of my, my, maybe a bigger fade I might have this week might be can't lay. I'm, I might still have 10, 15% and just be half the field there. Um, mm-hmm. How aggressive do you guys get with some of these, uh, these fades in your player pool? Are you curating a player pool and like just straight up Xing out guys that you don't like in these different ranges or um, what's, what's your approach there? I do not X out hardly ever, um, yeah. but I will, I will make sure that I am going to be, you know, in Cantlay's case, I would probably end up with a max of 5% if I thought he was going to be 25%. If I thought he was going to be 30%, I would probably go even lower. It's, it's strangely though, if, if there's another, like, like thinking the Xander, if Xander's only, if Xander does end up, I think he'll end up a little bit higher. I think, you know, let's say Xander ends up 15%. Yeah, I would I could see myself ending up with six or 7%, but I'm again, it would only be just as a, okay, well, I've got so much exposure to the, to the DJ Cam Smith lineup or, or whatever that I want to get a little bit, of, a little bit of off of that and get some Xander mixed in. Um, but I, but I would still try to be at least, I, generally my rule is to try to go at least half the field on guys that I want to make a fade on, but oftentimes more, more, more than if the guy's 20% or over, I try to go uh, at least w- like one quarter of the field is where I try to end up. Kenny, how about you on that one? Yeah, I, I, I basically do something similar. Uh, and, you know, I've come across this quite a bit with Saberson builds and, and I just basically put a cap on the max exposure down to, you know, I, I typically just do like half whatever projected is if it's someone real popular. This week with Cantley, for example, uh, you know, I don't want much exposure to him at all. Um, and mm-hmm. especially if he's going to be one of the higher, you know, we, Sheets has him as our the second highest projected own play on the slate yeah. after Spieth. And, uh you know, for me, it's like, well, Spieth, I get the Spieth narrative a little bit more. He's, he's, he's kind of on one right now. Um, Cantley obviously is great, but uh, he also just, he has a really bad history with majors. So that just makes it easy for me to be like, I'll, you know, I'll cap his ownership at 5% or something like that. And just, okay. If he gets in there, he gets in there. But also I think usually what ends up happening in my builds is, you know, I, I'll, I'll target a couple of guys in the range, especially this, this happens so much more often, you know, uh, in the nine to 10 K, uh, you know, plus range, right. Because there, everyone has favorites in, in this range, in the top 20 guys, everyone's got a couple of favorites. Someone's a fanboy of someone. Right. Ooh. And uh, for me, it's just kind of, it, it usually naturally sorts itself out because if I don't, if I don't like Cantley this week and I, that means I am going to like some other guys. And in this, this week's, uh, you know, scenario, it happens to be the two most expensive. And so, because I'm going to be targeting those guys, naturally Cantley is just really not going to make it into any of my builds because his ownership is already projected high, which is just going to kind of, he's going to play himself out anyway, you know, in the Saberson build. So it, it, mm-hmm. it usually just evens out for me pretty, pretty nicely. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, makes sense. Um, let's jump, let's jump down to the 8k range. And this is the more I'm leaning, the more I'm looking at this, I do think I'm going to be looking at double spending up more and more. Cause while I'm certainly fine with some of the guys in these, in this range, um, I think that I'm not, I don't feel as worried about these guys killing me. I think that Sam Burns could make a run and I like his ownership. Um, I think Zalatoris is always going to be very, very good in majors just with his game is just his game suits that uh, I'm totally fine uh, being underweight on Daniel Berger. Uh, one of the things we don't talk about very often, Jordan, uh, and people I don't hear other people saying we're looking at it, how players will do in the tournament. And it's yeah, it's hard to know with the routes that Daniel Berger. I, I read a thing. I think it was a couple months ago and I can't remember who wrote it, but it was a really interesting thing about how low scoring he was for how his results were. He was like like 10 points below on average, basically where, where he ended up finishing uh, in the, in terms of uh, actually finished the tournament. Yeah. Um, another guy who's sort of the opposite of that, a guy who I play a lot of, you know, on a d- totally different tier is that Patton Kazire is a guy who tends to be incredibly streaky. So tends to go closer to, yeah, I think it was like eight or seven or eight points better than where he should be 
um, based on where he's finishing because he ends up getting on these weird birdie streak rolls. He ends up making a lot of, you know, he'll, 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 uh, he'll make, he's, you know, he's an eagle, he's a big guy. So, he, you know, has more chances for Eagle maybe than some other guys do. Mm -hmm. And but that sort of keeps me off burger in, in a lot of GPPs. And look, I've made a lot of money. I almost won the millionaire earlier this year with burger in that lineup. Um, but it was another one of those where he, he was, he was significant. He scored significantly lower points than everybody around him. Anyway, just wanted to, to throw that out there, but I don't feel in love with this whole range. I, I'm a little like, like if we're talking about Brooks, you know, and worrying about him and all this stuff, like, you know, that I, I, I don't think that, I think Bryce is the best example of this. We really don't know, but I, I just haven't seen anything that's led me to believe that he's close to back yet. Uh, one of these days, he's going to prove me, prove that wrong. I am not going to be playing him when that happens. And uh, all this to say, basically the guys who I'm interested in in this range are, are Neiman. Cause I want to, I like one of the things I try to focus on is uh, with golf is to really try and catch guys who I think are going to be going to be elite on their way up. And I've made really good runs with guys like Sam Burns when I caught him at the beginning of his streak and uh, for a little while, Matt Wolf, and then it completely went the other direction. Yeah. Um, uh, Taylor Gooch to some extent, but Neiman is one of those guys to me who I, who I believe is an elite golfer uh, and is going to be one of the better golfers in the world. One of the best 30 golfers in the world for the next, I don't know, let's say 10, 15 years at least. Um, so I, I love Neiman in this range. I, I could certainly could, could understand an argument for Lowry, uh, but I probably am going to be the most heavy on Neiman. Uh, Neiman and Homa are the guys who I, I have on my list, but a lot of that is ownership based. And I think Louie is going to be crazy popular. I certainly understand it. I don't think I'm going to get there myself, uh, but I, oh, I also want to mention Corey Connors that I think yeah. is, a, is, a, is a solid play there as well. So those are the three guys I like the best in this range. How about you, Jordan? Then we'll go to Kenny after you. Yeah, I, I think it's interesting. So I like, I like the Neiman play there as well. Um, I, you know, I think some of this starts to become kind of interesting for, for what contest you're building for too. Um, it is hard, you know, if this is for the, the $25 milli with, with however many people, it, it's hard for me to just say, yeah, I'm not interested in an eight, three Bryson. I know the injury there. Mm -hmm. Um, I know hasn't, you just haven't even seen him that much this season at all. Uh, but talking about, you know, just how unique and how different you have to get to, to really separate yourself from the field in a contest that big, um, I probably have some interest in at least, you know, at 5% owned, you, what do you need? 10% to, to get a little positive leverage over the field on a guy like that. Yep. I'm probably in, if I'm building for something uh, like the, the Millie maker this week uh, on a guy like Bryson, but um, otherwise, yeah, I mean, it feels like you kind of fall off the cliff uh, when you drop down into the 8k range, just compared to the names that we were just looking at in the 9k range. I think I'm probably playing uh, an ownership game here as well. Uh, I do like at the bottom end here. I like Louis Connors Homa. Um, I think where this ownership goes in this high sevens, low eights range is going to be really interesting uh, mm -hmm. because I don't think any of these guys separate themselves too much for me. And I'm curious if the field ends up uh, getting really bought in on one of these guys. I mean, obviously Saber thinks that, you know, 18% to Louie, I, I think this could be, I think there's a few things that could happen. I think we could have the situation like this where one guy gets kind of popular in this range. I also think it's popular that we flip all the cards over Thursday morning and every single guy uh, from like Homa to even Finau are like 12% or something like right, that. Right, um, right. So yeah. yeah. No, I think that's a really, I think that's a, that's a, that absolutely, I could see it going that way. And, and guys, before, you know, make sure to try to look at the most updated projections every time. When, and that's mm -hmm. just true, a good, a good rule of thumb in general, things will change, things will pick up steam and, and, uh, and something will happen. Somebody withdraws and all of a sudden that, that guy's all of a sudden everybody else's gets adjusted. So don't, don't take a, just make sure you check, you check the ownerships right before you do it, especially as it relates to a single entry, but this is more for larger field stuff anyway, anyway. Um, Kenny, what do you like in this range? And, uh, you know, what, where, where do you think you're going to be standing? Are you going to be off? Yeah. This? So I, uh, so I like, uh, I like us, uh, in this range. Also, I'm, I'm shocked to see Sabersim has him so highly projected own because everywhere else looks like he, he's sub 10%, which is interesting. I don't know what to make of that. Well, that's, um, well, let me throw something out with that too. Cause, cause like Jordan said, there's a lot of, it doesn't, it doesn't account for maybe some of the narrative driven things. And people, mm -hmm. the ownership for a guy like Louis is going to be lower. Uh, sorry, sorry, lower on other sites or, or projected to be lower, and that and it's because of perception to some extent. Because yeah, he withdrew out of you know he withdrew from the Masters after playing the Tiger Day One. He withdraws more than basically any golfer on tour. Um, and last year was the one time when he really made yeah. a run at the you know at the, at the Player of the Year or whatever. But he where he didn't wasn't withdrawing as much. But he does withdraw more often than anybody else, and that gets stuck in people's heads. And I think that it ends up making him lower owned than maybe a 
a site that's doing, uh, uh, sorry, uh, simulations would be able to account for. Does that make sense, Jordan? Absolutely. And you'll see, I mean, I, I, so I'm, as we're kind of just going through and talking this here, I, I'm bumping a couple guys up, down, based on what you guys say, as, as we talk about ownership, I'm making some adjustments here. I think, you know, for, for anybody using Saversim to build their golf lineups, this is, I think, a really good approach is just make these little adjustments here or there. Don't even worry, you know, two things. One, you don't need to worry about getting everything perfect on Saversim in step one, because we have the opportunity to fine tune at the end, which we can talk about here in a second. Uh, but two, you know, most important thing is I always, I always tell people to try to be directionally correct here, right? If you think 18% looks a little high for Louie, which I do, don't worry about what the exact right number is. Just give it a little bit of a bump down, whatever that ends up meaning. And mm -hmm. if you're right, if he ends up coming in anywhere lower than 18, basically, uh, it's you are going to have built a better set of lineups to capitalize on that. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that I have no sense. problem with that. I don't think people like to click on Louie's name very much either. Uh, also, I think Corey Connors and Matt Fitzpatrick are almost always a little bit higher than we project yeah, yeah, um, at the exact yeah. same price. I think that they're going to come a little bit higher. So I, I could see the ownership splitting up a little bit more. I yeah. Agree. And I think that's pretty, I think that's universal across the industry that, that those guys always, you know, and Xander's another one that I tend to find almost all, uh, all sites have him, you know, he always ends up a little higher on them than we haven't projected for. Um, let's jump down in the seven K range real quick. I'm actually, I'm, I'm excited to get to the six K range. because I'm going to be taking a lot of shots. I mean, I do think Kenny and I are going to end up with some similar style builds. Uh, Cause I, I like this double spend up idea. Uh, the more and more I keep looking through this slate mm -hmm. and uh, but in the seven K range, I guess I'll just start it off with, couple guys who I'm going to be high on and Kenny's going to can already tell you one of them. I'm sure because he's the guy I talk about every time and everybody goes, Oh, but he never gets there. I'm like, well, at 7,600, if a guy top twenties, I'm not feeling bad about it. Okay. And uh, I really like Tommy Fleetwood. I'm going to continue that. I don't care that he, you know, wasn't great last week. I, he's a guy who I, I'm always overweight on. And actually it's been really, really good to me and kept me in tournaments uh, quite a bit over, you know, a lot, a lot. He, maybe he didn't win me a tournament, but if you look at that guy's, you know, what is it? The T21 was like the worst he finished. We went through like a, a five tournament stretch where that was the worst he finished. And, uh, and I just think he's a really, really solid guy. And I, I like the price on him. So I will be very overweight on Fleetwood. I'm, I'm, I'm sort of interested. I'd like to get Kenny's thoughts in a minute on, on Webb and Fitz. I, I like Fleetwood and Fit. I like Fleetwood, Fitz, Cam Young. Um, and other than that, I am really struggling with the seven K range. And that's, this is weird. Cause there's so many great golfers, but I don't feel like I need to play any of these guys. I don't feel excited about a lot of these guys. Uh, I don't know. I usually, I usually love the seven K range and I'm, I'm finding a bunch of guys that rather take shots on the six K range that certainly aren't as good as golfers. Oh, I forgot my obvious play. Um, what, it, because he had one tournament, what, what is up with his Taylor Gooch ownership? Is, it, is this is this getting a little bit too crazy that he's going to be only two percent owned? This is a guy who is you know everybody's darling at basically every tournament in this range. It has a couple of bad tournaments, and all of a sudden we've got him down at you know two percent projected ownership. That just feels like okay, that's something I probably have to take a stand on to be at least ten percent of them. Uh, maybe to, maybe even up to twenty if it really does stay that low. Does that does that stand out to you a little bit, Jordan? Does that seem a little bit? I mean, I, I just don't remember ever seeing a tournament where Gooch wasn't like fifteen percent owned. <laughs> Yeah, that's another name that I think uh, people people like to click on. Always comes up a little bit higher there. I'm fine even just kind of bumping that up and, and mm -hmm. maybe saying that we think he's going to come in a little bit higher. Mm -hmm. um, I think ownership in this range is pretty interesting, and I think it could end up getting dictated really heavily just by recent form. Um, I mean, a guy that just popped out the first time I was going through this was Siwu down at 7-2. Mm -hmm. um, a guy that can flash upside, especially when when he's taken the, the tournament seriously and, and wants to win it. Um, yep. It just seems like a name that just stands out amongst the other names here of uh, just straight up seems underpriced to me. Um, that was one name that, that popped out here. Um, I think if we end up getting an over 10% owned Jason Day here at 7-5, I probably will just almost completely fade him. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that seems a little just strangely high off of like maybe just a little bit of decent recent form. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, I, I hear you. Um, uh, Kenny, curious your thoughts on this range. Cause there's a lot of guys we've talked about having, yeah. you know, as we thought it would have bounce back years and, and like Adam Scott, and I know you, you said before the season, you like Jason day to have a bounce back year. Um, so we'll talk about this range I of do. what you're doing. Cause this does seem like a lot of your guys. Yeah, I do like Jason Day. Um, you know, he's been playing great. Uh, he looks like he's in good form. Um, I think that he's going to have a pretty good week. I also like, um, you know, I like Cam Young this week, but I'm probably going to be off him just mostly because of ownership and also just because of course comp here to Augusta and he, you know, missed the cut there. Mm -hmm. um, makes it just a little easier to talk myself out of him when I, I like him. I've, I've basically played Cam Young every week this season so far that I've played. Mm -hmm. 
Um, I also um, I have a little bit of interest in Leishman, although you know not too much. Um, and I'll probably be focused actually on um, Keegan Bradley, which is a golfer that I don't ever really mm. focus on or call out. But I just think uh, with his ownership being projected so low, um, you know, his ball striking's great. He's in fantastic form. Um, you know, mm. and and it's not really. Uh, you know, uh, there's not a part of his game that isn't, isn't, you know, super solid. So I, and this is the, you know, new course, <clears throat> new course for him, new course for a lot of players actually this year, uh, cause it hasn't been played since 2007. So, um, it's in, you know, in some other analysis I was listening to, it's a course that has a lot of options, right? So, you know, there's going to be a lot of different ways to approach different holes, um, you know, in mm -hmm. terms of distance and stuff, it's a little bit shorter. So we're not worried about like bombers or anything like that. So I actually really, really like uh, Keegan Bradley in this range. Um, and then also for this exact same reasons, ball striking, uh, decent form, uh, you know, lately. Um, although, you know, he missed the cut, I guess, in the past two out of the past three. But um, also just projected low ownership is Gary Woodland, uh, who's yeah. also, you know, just one of those experienced guys. And, and you know, when it comes to, you know, there, there is game theory on tournament play for the golfers, you know, how yep. they approach each round and, and how they approach each hole. And, uh, you know, these guys, some of these guys like Woodland, who's been around for a long time, they have that head game and they know how to get there. You know, Woodland, uh, he's one of those guys that you won't hear about on Friday or, or, you know, Thursday or Friday. And then all of a sudden late on Saturday, you're like, holy shit, he's top five. Where did he come from? You know what I mean? Because mm -hmm. he figured out the course and he just he got his strategy together and stuck to it. So, um, yeah, that's, that's going to be my focus here in the, in the range. I like it. Um, uh, Jordan, do we, sorry, I'm, I'm sort of bouncing around here. What, uh, yeah, I guess, I guess we covered that range. So wait, Jordan, did I get, did I, did I go to you? No, you got, you got sorry, me. I think the only other name that, that I think just, and again, this is kind of just on, on the name value here, thinking about, you know, compared to the prices I've seen for some of these guys in recent weeks, I, I think. Mav McNeely jumps out a little bit to me too, mm -hmm. as somebody that's, that's interesting, just stands out here in that range for me. Um, I do like the Gary Woodland night Woodland idea. We had, we have, we've had events in the, the last month here where 25% of the field wanted to click on yep. Woodland's name. And now we're yeah, talking about the, ma the masters. He was, I think he was almost 30% owned in like the single entries and the high buy-ins for sure. Exactly. Yeah. And, and now we're talking about 2% uh, owned. I know a uh, recent form in the very last couple of weeks hasn't been as good, but um, for, for somebody with the experience that he has, I can, I can see a bounce back and I'm willing, I guess, well, a better way to put that. I'm willing to take a shot on the bounce back at 2% mm -hmm. ownership in this event. So, right. That makes perfect sense. Um, all right, let's, ju let's jump into to the, to the fun, you know, let's take some shots to your, yeah, uh, these six K guys and what we can do with them. Uh, I got, I've got a list of some guys who just are all different that I, that I'm sort of, that sort of caught my eye, um, for different reasons. All right. So, uh, let's see the ones I've got the best. Uh, and again, I can't play all these guys, but I, I have quite a big list. So I'm, this is probably what I'm going to do is rotate a number of these guys with some of my high spend ups on uh, in a lot of my lineups. As Kenny mentioned, he was going to do, which I wasn't, I, I hadn't decided what I was going to do. And it wasn't because just because Senny, Kenny said it, it was because I really think that that's just the way that I like these builds. I want some shots on, I want to take some Ryan Palmer, Johnny Vegas, Chris Kirk, um, Carlos Ortiz, Patton Kazire, uh, Aaron Wise, Lanto Griffin, Chris, oh, I already mentioned Chris Kirk. And the one I'll be the heaviest on will be Mito Pereira, another one I want to get ahead of. And look, I am open to being biased. My girlfriend is Chilean, so I'm always higher on, on Neiman and Pereira than, uh, than maybe most people are. Um, but uh, but I, I do just like Mito, and I want to get ahead of the you know a guy who I think is going to be a contender for a while or just like a, just a really good golfer that I feel like is sort of always underpriced and always, you know, sort of in, not in the thick of things, not necessarily going to win you win a tournament, but does, uh, does, does have some upside. It is interesting that KH Lee at no ownership at 65 yeah. hundred. Um, that's one I, I I'm trying to figure out what to do. And I'm going to, I'm going to ask you guys both your thoughts on that. I'm curious to hear Kenny. I, I know it's a guy, you know, we've talked about a number of times in the past. The other ones are Adam Hadwin. Um, I know I mentioned a lot of names, but I'm really, I really think I'm going to be mixing in part portions of all these guys. And uh, the other guy who I have a friend who referred me to, or told me to play, to play Hashino. Um, I didn't know anything about this guy whatsoever. So I have to do some more research on that, but that was just another name because I am going to probably be playing multiple guys from this range in a good portion of my lineups, um, just the way I'm going this week. Uh, Jordan, talk a little bit about that and then we'll get over to Kenny's thoughts. 
Yeah, you know, honestly, so I, I bumped up a, a lot of those names that, that you mentioned here. I think this this is where it gets a little bit tougher. And, and to be totally honest, I'm willing to trust the Sims a little bit more when we start talking about this bottom range. I think it's hard to find some some differentiators. Um, I, I was surprised two names that popped off for me uh, when I first out, looked down here, KH Lee, uh, right, fresh off an amazing performance last week mm-hmm. um, here. And Sebastian Munoz. Um, oh, yes. I can't I find him now. Um, another name, a guy that we actually think is going to be a little bit chalkier here at this range. I, I'm not sure um, how that that ends up spreading out. I, I think I think it's hard for a six eight golfer really almost ever to to really get very chalky. Um, I think could be a little bit more popular, but a, a guy that one jumps out in the Sims, right, showing a actually pretty decent top five, top ten equity down here in this range, um, and another guy that I'd be a little bit interested in playing. Interesting. Um... Uh, oh, I, I did want to mention, I, I do like the Munoz call and I, and I want to throw, what, throw out two more guys I actually had on my list. Or actually, I'm going to be all over this. That's what I'm going to do. I'm spread out this range and yeah. uh, keep it narrow at the, up at the top. But uh, Davis Riley, another guy who I believe in the talent and I want to keep, I want to get ahead of the field on him in general. Uh, and the other one is I, I had another, you know, same friend, uh, really likes Lahiri and Cam Davis this week. Uh, again, because we, we, you know, yeah. I talked, I just, I just texted him before he came on and uh, just, I was just surprised to hear those names. So I, so I'm just throwing all that out there. Kenny, I know there's a lot of names that I threw out there. But yeah. I, I, so I, I love uh, Anir Bon Lahiri this week. Uh, yeah. I love that call. I'll definitely be focused on him, be probably very heavy overweight on him. And that's not going to be hard to do, but I mean, I'll be real heavy on him. Mm-hmm. Um, also, you know, this range. So uh, I want to not forget right at 7k uh, uh hv3 who i'll be on heavy this mm-hmm. week as well mm-hmm. uh, also doesn't look like he's going to be you know crazy owned um you know maybe a little bit more in the range but uh i'm going to like hv3 this week and then there's you know the same narrative i was talking about some of these more experienced guys that um you know are great ball strikers and have been in good recent form uh kevin kisner and matt kuchar <laughs> both mm-hmm. uh you know old timers with uh great uh you know ball striking don't have to worry about distance off the tee this week um you know they're they they have the experience to be able to adjust their game and you know get there um and these are guys that are you know really really great that have had you know great careers and are, are in the 6k range now no no problem i'll take them at a discount and then also um so, you know, in these ranges, uh, as you know, Bobby, I like to kind of, <laughs> I, I do a lot of like nitpicking into the people that, that don't really, there isn't a lot of data on because uh, they don't play the PGA tour often or whatever, you know, they're on, they're on the world tour, they're on the European tour, whatever they're doing. Uh, and there's two guys that I actually really like this week who don't pop anywhere uh, because they're, you know, world tour players, but they've both been in, you know, just on a tear recently on the world tour. And I understand it's not as difficult to field on the world tour. It's not as difficult to courses and everything, but you know, when you get these guys who are, you know, in the six K range who the past 10 tournaments, they've, you know, top five, four of them and top 20 of the rest, like, yeah, I want some exposure to that, especially because they're like the 1% ownership guys. Mm-hmm. And those two names this week for me are Adri Arnu- Arnos at 6,700. And then uh, Ryan Fox at 6,300. Hmm. Both guys, uh, you know, have been just tearing up the world tour lately. There's no data on them, so they don't project well anywhere. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they're kind of just unknowns, but those are the guys that's, that's when I lick my lips. You know what I mean? It's like, yeah. okay, great. And then the last guy also in, in the, uh, 6k range here that I really like that I'm going to be pretty heavy on, uh, who I think is, it's weird that he's getting so overlooked is, uh, JJ Spawn. Oh, that's a really good call. I actually didn't mention that one either. That's a, re- I, I think that's, I mean, look, this guy's looked really, really good. And it's funny if you look, if you follow things like data golf, you know, you look at the guys and on the same hole he's at, or maybe a hole ahead or behind, but at the same scores, you always see his projection for the top five and top 20 at those points much higher. And every tournament we go into, and yet nobody keeps playing him. And he's had some, some, some incredible results, including that win earlier this year before the masters. Um, I like that call quite a bit. And I'm, I'm a little bit surprised that there is going to be zero ownership on him. And I don't, I didn't exactly understand the reason, except for that there is a bunch of guys down here that at least I'll be spreading out, but nobody's really playing that many of these guys. I, I just love the JJ spawn call. I think that's something I'm definitely going to do. And I'll probably consider it for my big buy-ins um, like that call a lot and do listen guys. When Kenny says the names like the Fox and all that stuff, he, he's been really good. I mean, I know it didn't work out with bland winning a tournament, but before anyone knew who Richard bland was, Kenny came on and said he was his favorite, favorite value play at the, what, what, what tournament was it? The U S open, U S open, US open last year. 
And he was and he, the going into the weekend. I mean, it was yeah. Like, oh. <laughs> yeah. Kenny's Kenny, Kenny does his research on this stuff. So these, we have our, I like to go on the young guys who I feel like there's less data on. Kenny tends to find the guys either from a foreign tours or sort of a similar thing. And, uh, and I think we've been pretty good at picking out some of those names and you've been good with JJ spawn so far this season too. Um, and gotten him right in a couple of good spots. So um, anything else that I'm missing before we get out of here, Jordan, I don't want to keep take up any more of your time. I know you're real busy, um, but anything else we didn't touch on maybe that you'd like to add or, or are we good to go? Uh, I mean, I'll, so I'll note just a couple quick things here. So I, as I've, we've been going along here, I've been bumping up uh, these projections of these guys. A, a common question I get is like, what, what happens when we do that? What is the impact of that? Do we still get to take advantage of the Sims? Um, the answer is yes, you absolutely do. Basically what happens, let's let, you know, we'll just take KH Lee. Actually, maybe not a great example there. Let's take um, Lahiri, right? So we bumped him up um, basically, well, a, a handful of points, right? What, what we end up doing there, uh, is we'll take his distribution that we actually have from the Sims and just shift it in the direction uh, of the adjustment from whatever he compares to at his mean, right? So, uh, you know, at the mean value, maybe it was 47 points, right? We've adjusted it up three points. The whole distribution just gets shifted up three points from where the raw Sims were. So you still get to take advantage of the Sims. Uh, you still get rosters that are built based on the Sims. They're just slightly adjusted um, up or down from, from there. Um, so I wanted to mention that just cause that's a common question whenever we're adjusting projections. Um, certainly but, makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, do we, do we, did you guys want to just kind of like do a build here and see what it yeah, looks let's like run with, it. with all these little like, adjustments? Yeah. I'm, I'm curious. It. Yeah. Um, we might as well, I'll build us a, a bigger pool here just so we have something to work with here and, um, yeah, let's see what we got. This is so cool. <laughs> so when do you recommend doing that, you know, adjusting the pool size? Um, it depends. So the 500 is kind of just a default value that we put down there that, that kind of one size fits all. Anytime mm -hmm. I'm building 150, I always build 1500 just right off the bat. Oh, Very okay. easy gotcha. um, rule of thumb there. Otherwise, it kind of depends on how much time I have. Um, obviously, it takes a little bit longer to build 1500 lineups if it's an NBA slate and news is breaking right before lock. I don't always have the right, luxury right, of 1500 right. for golf. You know, you got all day to really get everything dialed right. in here. Uh, when I, when it comes time to build my final lineups, I will probably just build 1500 just so I have them. If I decide I want to make a lot of adjustments to exposures and things like that, you've got that bigger pool to work with. So, um, I think we set it at 500 just because we found that in our data, that is enough lineups. That's a good a trade off between how long it's it like takes the to build starting the statistical and... significant value or something. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, yeah, it makes uh, definitely that's yeah, that's really interesting. So let's see, um, let's see what we got here. Um, so what, so what, so let's take a look at what, just at, you know some of the things. Some of the Ooh, that's I, a juicy one. Rory, I like Munoz, that. Joe's Oost, Scheffler, Sergio. That's I like a, that. That's a, that's a really interesting one. We didn't mention Sergio, Kenny. You're always high on Sergio at the majors. What do you think about this week? I don't know what to do with Sergio. You know, and I, I think it's. Um, I think it's going to be a, 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 a breakthrough or a bust week for him. So that kind of scares me. And um, yeah, I just don't, I don't, I, he, he has, he, he has such a terrible history <laughs> at the PGA too, that it just yep. seems like, it seems like I don't need to worry about him this week, especially because okay. I don't, you know, the field doesn't look like they're going to be on him. So I don't need to be either, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I'm not, I'm, I, 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 uh, I was just curious because we didn't, we, one guy we didn't mention, but I do think these are interesting builds and you do see, you know, I, I talk all the time and when you're trying to win big tournaments, you have to, especially in golf, you, you almost have to have at least two guys that are hopefully sub 5%, if not at least sub 10%. Um, but I think the ideal number would be three or four that you would want because of the high variance nature of the game. And it's sort of, you can see how some of these builds are coming in. You're getting different, you know, you've got the, you've got basically four in most of these uh, mm -hmm. and three and some others where you're sub 5% uh, golfers that really, it, you know, just, I always like to emphasize that point. People always say, how many low owned guys, how many this, that, all it's slate dependent for other sports, but for a golf tournament, I like to try to get that in most of my builds. Um, yeah. Any thoughts on sort of what builds that those so, things out, Jordan? I, I, I have a question real quick for you, yeah. Jordan. So yeah. one, one thing I like here is the, the level column that pops out, right? Which is like the, your level of exposure, like what's your edge basically. Yep. yep. Um, so, so here's, here's the thing. So what I typically do, I pay attention to that, right? And a lot of times like in an initial build and I'm gonna to totally approach my builds differently here. And I like what you're doing ahead of time by adjusting the projections up and that kind of feeds in what you're looking for rather than yeah. I've been just doing it completely retroactive. 
So that's going to totally change my process uh, starting today. But what I've also, you know, so often what has happened to me in the past is my level of exposure, like my highest uh, edge guy, you know, will be someone that I just really don't have any interest in. That's like, yeah. a, you know, 7,200 or something like that. And, you know, typically what I do is I just like cap the max exposure when that happens. Is that like the right thing to do there? Or I guess maybe uh, adjusting the, the projections ahead of time might solve that more frequently. I'm not sure. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's kind of up to you. Either works fine. Um, I think yeah. if you have a number in your mind of what that exposure should be, it's very easy to just put that exposure in here. Like I, I mentioned Siwoo Kim. Uh, I don't need him to be our second highest uh, leverage right. in this entire build. So if I bring him, you know, maybe 10% feels right. Right. And right. I bring that down. Um, and that's a very good way to just get an immediate impact there. Um, another option I think, you know, is, is to do the projections. Um, it, it is a little less like precise, a little less surgical, but maybe you think that's, oh, so if you, oh, I didn't realize that if you change the projections here, it, it adjusts on the fly. Uh, yep. I, that's, I hadn't even thought to do that. <laughs> yeah. And I think different people have different, like intuitive, approaches. I, I'll talk to some people and they're like, I, I don't want to worry about the exposures too much. I don't care if it's 30% versus 35. I, I work with the projections. And I talk to other people that are like, no, I want 25% exposure to this guy. And so whatever really kind of floats your boat, I guess, here on step three is, is fine in terms of editing. But yeah, if we, if we bump these guys up or down, um, that will, it will dynamically update here, uh, oh, awesome. as we go along. So nice. Um, one other thing I just kind of wanted to show off here, something that I think people kind of sleep on, I think is a cool way to use this here, um, especially for golf, just because I think it, it resonates with people. So, you know, this is for like a 150 max build, but let's say, you know, maybe you were just trying to pick out 10 lineups or so that you really liked. As soon as this build finished, you guys mentioned you like this first lineup. One thing you can do here uh, is just collapse that sidebar there, um, put your exposure table away. And then what I'll do is I'll set this to zero sometimes, especially if I'm just playing a couple lineups. Take all the lineups. Actually, that didn't seem to work. I'll set it to one. Let's try that instead. And then I'll go ahead and go to the pool. And instead of working with the exposures, I'll just click in lineups I like. Lineups that pop out to me for one reason or another. Uh, maybe there's a combination of players that I think is going to be unique. Or maybe it's a particularly really low own, mm. uh, pro low projected own build. Or um, one thing that will jump out to me sometimes is maybe you get a lineup occasionally, especially in a large field thing. I might be willing to leave a little extra salary on the table. Maybe like a 4-8 kind of build will work out. And if you're trying to find 150 lineups, this is going to take a really long time. It's not always the most pleasant way to get to 150. But if you're building even 20, uh, building yourself a pool of 1,500 and going through and kind of clicking in the builds that you like from this, this big set, uh, I think can also be kind of a fun way to, to get to your final pool of lineups. So I thought I'd show that off. I think uh, don't often always talk about, you know, ways to use SaberSim for, for people that are maybe a little bit more used to the hand building style or maybe want to be a little bit more dialed in. Uh, that's, yeah, that's really interesting, really cool. man. Uh, yeah, I think that's really helpful. Yeah. Um, well, I really appreciate you doing this. And, and I, um, I, I mean, this is great stuff. And, we, and, you know, this is something, again, guys, even if you're watching this after the fact or anything like that, this is a very, very helpful uh, in terms of knowing how to, how to utilize uh, SaberSim. Nobody knows it better than Jordan. We will try to keep having Jordan on and going through this stuff more often. We also are going to incorporate a lot on all of our shows, which we started doing uh, before I ended up having to, to be out for a little bit. But we want to start incorporating uh, SaberSim in, in a lot more of our shows and talking about specific questions and how we can make things better. I really do believe the package you can get through us, uh, uh, SaberSim through us, is a, is a really valuable package between Sheets, Rody, and I, all, all of our information, all of our data, and then uh, fat, you know, the, the, what I, you know, I look at as the best projection site out there. Uh, and uh, yeah, we're just thrilled to be on board with you guys. So thanks so much. Thanks so much to you, Kenny. And uh, anything else? Do you guys have anything else before we get out of here? That's it for me. I'm excited for this week now. Looking forward to it. All right. Well, also, uh, one time. last thing. Go Tiger. Oh yeah. By the way, I, I mean, you know, just out of my heart alone, I'm definitely going to play a little, I'm going to throw Tiger out there, um, but it's going to be, in, it's only going to be in a few lineups probably, but anyway, yeah, go Tiger. Let's, let's, let's go. Um, good luck to everybody this week. And uh, we'll hopefully see you guys at the top of the leaderboards.